Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about supercharging and turbocharging engines. So we turbo and supercharge aviation engines in order to increase our critical altitude. It's uh, We do get a benefit at lower altitudes from them if they're set up to get that benefit, uh, but it's not like cars where we're trying to get better gas mileage or better power out of them with these turbo and superchargers. The re it's really primarily about being able to fly around at higher altitudes. So a, a normally aspirated engine, uh, as you climb, the manifold pressure decreases one inch for every thousand feet that you climb. And we talked about that uh, in previously in the term. Um, the pilot has to adjust the throttle in order to compensate for that. And at some point, you reach full throttle in order to have climb manifold pressure. And then above that, your manifold pressure decreases, and there's really nothing you can do about it. That's called critical altitude. And that's the altitude where the full throttle is required to maintain the desired manifold pressure. So here's what that looks like on a chart. Um, we see that in order to hold 65% horsepower, which is a cruising horsepower, uh, we can only get that in this particular aircraft up to a little over 10,000 feet, maybe 10,500 feet. And then above that altitude, um, our available power for cruising drops off. With a super or turbocharger, uh, we can get that full 65% cruise horsepower clear up to 19,000 feet. Um, and that allows us to go faster. Here, our maximum cruising speed with without the turbocharger was 140 uh, uh, but with the fuel supercharger uh, we can do 155 and and uh, uh, and that's all at the same power so you're you're burning the same amount of fuel but getting a lot more speed out of it by going up high so there's an advantage to it Superchargers um, are found mostly on radial or large reciprocating engines, and they get their energy for compressing air directly from the crankshaft through a set of gears. And they usually compress the fuel-air mixture, so the, the fuel gets mixed with the incoming air, and then we compress them both together. So they can sometimes include more than one stage, so it may go through one impeller and then get compressed again in a second co impeller. Another option is to have a little miniature transmission that allows you to engage the supercharger at on high or low setting. And you would use low typically for takeoff at low altitudes and then switch to high once you're up at higher altitude. So here's a cross section of what that might look like on an actual aircraft. This is where the carburetor would sit and the fuel air mixture would come down and get compressed by the supercharger impeller and which is driven directly from the crankshaft and that provides a more sea level like pressure in the intake manifold. You guys probably won't be running superchargers uh, in your career but there's a very good chance that you'll run into a turbocharger out there. Um, turbochargers use energy from the exhaust to run the compressor. Uh, so the exhaust gases spin a turbine. The turbine is connected to an impeller in the compressor. Um, they usually uh, compress unmixed air, I think primarily because there's so much heat going on with these things. Um, having a fuel-air mixture next to that heat would be a little bit problematic. But uh, so we, And then we, we use these typically in conjunction with a fuel injection system. So here's uh, a picture out of your reading of uh, a, a sort of cutaway uh, turbocharger unit. And the blue side here is representing the compressor. The red side is representing the exhaust. So the exhaust uh, comes in here at the bottom and spins these little impeller blades, or turbine blades rather, uh, and then exits out the exhaust. Uh, the more exhaust that the engine is producing, the faster that tends to spin, but we have a way of controlling it, uh, which we'll get to here in a minute. Um, on the compressor side, the faster that turbine uh, is spinning, the faster this compressor impeller wheel over here is turning, and it's drawing in uh, outside air, compressing it to something closer to sea level, and providing that to the engine. 
Here's an actual physical cutaway so you can kind of see what one looks like. And we'll try to put one in your hands uh, in class as well. So we control the speed of the turbocharger with something called the waste gate. And the waste gate is, directs whether the exhaust is going to go through the turbine or not. If we direct all of the exhaust through the turbine, then the turbine spins as fast as possible. If we want to slow the turbine down a little bit, we can waste uh, some of that exhaust by routing it around the turbine wheel, and we call that a waste gate. Uh, so when a waste gate is closed, it's pushing all the exhaust through the turbine. When we open the waste gate, we waste some of the exhaust, and it goes around the turbine and does not speed the turbine up. Uh, so we use this to control turbocharger output. Here's a, uh, a cross-section out of your book of a wastegate controller. Uh, the butterfly valve here is where the exhaust would be flowing through. And the, that is controlled via some uh, oil pressure. And we'll talk more about how that works here in just a minute. So here is a diagram of a typical system. Uh, we have the uh, exhaust being produced here at each cylinder and it is directed down towards this turbine blade. We have a waste gate over here and if we want to slow the turbine down all we have to do is open the waste gate and that allows more of the exhaust to flow down this path uh, which means the turbine wheel can slow down. That controls the output of the compressor, which is here. And the output of the compressor is what we call upper deck pressure. So it's upper deck pressure until you get to the throttle. And then the throttle then gives us our manifold pressure. So just like we're used to, there's a pressure drop across the throttle. So we have upper deck pressure, then it gets down lower and becomes manifold pressure. Now, the, how much the waste gate is open is being controlled by this, this, oil, this waste gate controller unit here. Um, if upper deck pressure gets high, it provides pressure here to a little diaphragm. The diaphragm opens the little valve and vents some oil back to the sump, which drops the pressure in the waste gate actuator and allows the wastegate to open, wasting some of the exhaust, which means that the turbine slows down, which means the compressor slows down, which drops the upper deck pressure. The important thing to know about that as a pilot is that there is something that is controlled by engine oil that controls the upper deck pressure via a wastegate. They do tend to get stuck from time to time, and you'll know that because you're, you'll have difficulty keeping the uh, manifold pressure where you want it. So there's a couple of ways that that can um, reveal itself. Um, some of these uh, will happen even with a normal healthy system from time to time. But if you're starting to get a, a, a sticky waste gate, um, these are more likely to occur. So one is that you're getting overboost, where the, uh, uh, the manifold pressure is exceeding the limitations in the POH. Um, a good way to avoid that with a healthy system is to just make your power adjustments slowly and smoothly and, uh, and, and avoid quick, uh, sudden power changes. Uh, if you're doing that and you're still getting overboost, that would be a sign that your wastegate or wastegate controller is malfunctioning. Another th sign might be overshoot for where the manifold pressure goes past the desired setting as you're increasing power. And again, that's, that could be a normal system and you've just moved the throttle too quickly. Uh, but if you're really having trouble with that in spite of being very careful, then it's worth having somebody look at the wastegate and wastegate controller. Bootstrapping is where the, uh, the, the manifold pressure seeks. So you, you, you set the manifold pressure and you say, as you're flying the aircraft, you see it increase and decrease and maybe 
one or two or three second cycles. And that can be triggered by minor, minor fluctuations in temperature and pressure. It's, it's not necessarily harmful or a sign that anything is wrong. Um, although if it gets worse than normal for the aircraft that you're flying, again, you might have a mechanic take a look at the wastegate and wastegate controller. So upper deck pressure is the turbocharger output. Um, that's the pressure after turbocharging but before the throttle. The pilot then reduces that pressure as needed with the throttle and that is the manifold pressure. Manifold pressure is after the throttle. So if we had a manual wastegate, you probably won't have to fly a turbocharger with a manual wastegate, but um, uh, but it's it's kind of good to, to run through this as a, a thought experiment. Um, we would run take off with the wastegate full open, so in other words, we're essentially turning the turbocharger off, and we would take off at full throttle, and we would climb, make our power reduction to our climb setting, and at some point our fall, throttle would be full open, uh, and normally that's where our manifold pressure would start tapering off as we climbed. Uh, but with the manual wastegate, what we would start doing is begin closing the wastegate, which spools the turbine up, which causes some compression for us and provides some upper deck pressure um, so that our manifold pressure does not uh, bleed off. And we would have to slowly increase um, that turbocharger setting by closing the wastegate moving the lever forward just like a throttle um, as we climb eventually the wastegate would be fully closed and the throttle would be fully open and that's our new critical altitude. Manual wastegates are simple and easy to add on to the uh, aircraft uh, but they result in a higher workload for the pilot um, during climbs and descents um, and so we, we don't really like those very much. Um, there's a high potential for uh, mismanaging that by the pilot, and uh, which can obviously be very expensive. An automatic wastegate is more desirable, um, and it's set up to so that the throttle basically acts the same as a normally aspirated engine. The controller keeps the up, upper deck pressure at one of three uh, basic pressures. One is to, one way to set up, and this is a design thing, it's not something the pilot so can select. Uh, one way to do it is to keep the upper deck pressure at about sea level and, and we refer to that as a normalized system. Um, another way is to keep the upper deck pressure at something higher than sea level and we call that ground boosted. Um, and then uh, finally a third way to do it is to uh, hook it up to the manifold pressure and just have the upper deck pressure stay a, an inch or two higher than the manifold pressure at all times. So we call that differential. All of those accomplish about the same thing um, and, and they do it about the same way via a wastegate. The controllers are slightly different but they, they work the same. We use a wastegate to do it. The way this would work from a pilot point of view is you would uh, take off at full throttle, make a power reduction to your climb setting, and then that's the last time you would touch the throttle or the propeller because they would just take care of themselves until the wastegate was fully closed at your new critical altitude. This is a diagram of a system installed on the aircraft and it, and it makes everything easy to see here. We have the exhaust coming out of the cylinders. They're driving the turbocharger. There is a bypass here, which is the wastegate, uh, and that allows us to slow the turbocharger down. The turbo driver charger is driving the compressor, which is providing the upper deck pressure, which is in blue here, and then that goes in and becomes reduced to manifold pressure by the throttle. Notice that there's an alternate air intake inside here. Um, that's typically in these installations not pilot controlled. That'll automatically open if the filter becomes clogged and it's spring loaded um, so that it will spring load closed again once the filter clears up. This is because we typically fly these things at higher altitudes where impact icing can be a factor on the uh, air filter and, and plug up the air filter. Uh, so it just kind of takes care of itself down there and it's nice warm air in the cockpit so that'll, that'll uh, usually stay open for you. 
Here's a uh, pretty good uh, diagram out of your book. Um, this is uh, one that I would recommend you take a look at. It kind of has everything on it. Um, we have the exhaust coming off of the, the cylinder here, uh, going down through the turbine. Uh, we have a bypass route that has the wastegate on it, and it shows the wastegate controller there being controlled by engine oil. Uh, and the engine oil is being relieved by the wastegate controller unit, and that controls the speed of the turbine. The turbine, through a, a shaft, runs the compressor, which compresses this incoming air to upper deck pressure, um, which then gets modified by the pilot uh, with the throttle, which is the one thing that's not shown here, uh, and, uh, and we get manifold pressure. Here's a picture of an engine with a turbocharger installed in it, so you have a sense of, of uh, what that entails. And uh, notice that it has an after cooler installed on it as well. And, and what that does is it brings the temperature of that compressed air back down a little bit. You, when you compress air with the uh, turbocharger, it tends to heat it up um, through uh, adiabatic heating. And uh, and so we have this after cooler where we're running nice cold air from outside through that little radiator. That cools the air back down and makes it more dense so that we can mix more fuel with it and make more power. Um, these are also often called intercoolers um, as well as after coolers. One little note that you have to uh, remember um, is if you get up to a high enough altitude where the waste gate is fully closed, the manifold response to RPM goes backwards. Norm remember normally uh, when RPM is decreased, manifold pressure increases a little bit because um, you're decreasing the demand for the fuel air mixture and, and so the, the, uh, the manifold pressure goes up slightly. Um, but with the waste gate closed, a reduction in RPM causes less exhaust, which means the turbo slows down and upper deck pressure decreases. So um, you decrease RPM, you get a decrease in manifold pressure as well. It's just backwards. That's it. And uh, we will take a look at a couple of real turbocharger systems in class, um, some historical appreciation, and uh, we will see you in class.